And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, creator of the upcoming Tales from Myriad, a game that is leaning heavily into console style RPG with a fit with a fair bit of a fair bit of di a fair bit of 2d6 some exploding die and lots and lots and lots of outfits the one and only Carson Daniel Low Miller how you doing today man or tonight hey, in your case how's it going? <laughs> yeah I am doing fine I am I'm happy to be here ready to talk and chat mm -hmm. get this thing a going so I usually open these with the humble beginnings, the origin story, if you will. So, with that in mind, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. All right. Um, this is fun. I get to talk about these things now. Um, and people don't quickly move on to a different subject. Uh, yeah, we do so things differently So, talking here. about that... <laughs> well, who knows? A million interviews in, and I'll just be like, Shut the Wikipedia page. It's <laughs> just written down. Um, so, Table of RPGs. I remember first seeing it in a Barnes & Noble, some version of D&D, &D, uh, and it just had to do with the dragon on the front, so I wanted to pick it up and look at it, um, and, and I was in a more strict, conservative, uh, religious household, so I was like, put that down, that's evil. Uh, cut to later, um, I don't know what it was, I think 4th Ed had come out. Uh, and once again, in a Barnes & Noble, I'm looking at it, and I was looking at the the cover of the PHP with the Dragonborn, the yellow Dragonborn mm -hmm. on it, and I was like, oh my god, like this art is so cool. So I I was talking to my older brother and, and my dad, and I was like, so, do you guys know anything about Dungeons & Dragons? And they looked at me just dumbfounded, because apparently... They had been playing, like, my, my oldest brother had been playing for a really long time, and my dad, like, three times as long as that, um, and had just never bothered to tell me. Um, so I think I got into it for, I don't know what it was. It was it was the imaginary fantastical aspect of it, of, like, I get to be this thing doing these things, and that's cool to me. Mm -hmm. Um because I, I think we only ever ran one game of 4th Ed, and it was just so not what my dad thought D&D &D was that we never played it again. Um, but I did wind up picking up a Pathfinder game with my oldest brother. Um, so I, I learned that away. Um, yeah, I think it was just the, the, the aspect of exploration i think i think was the biggest thing what made it stick was like oh i can go to these these crazy locations because i lived in a really really flat boring part uh, of the world where there was just nothing really interesting and i loved mountains because i had just never been around them and so i was like oh i get to explore mountains um and i think the exploration aspect of it is what kind of stuck around you lived in a very flat area. Why do you got to, why do you have to slander Denmark like that? It was not Denmark. I <laughs> am from America. <laughs> I'm not I'm, from I'm, I know. I just had, I just had to make that joke because of because you mentioned lots of flat area and that's that's the first thing that came to mind. I've had the joke that the tallest the tallest point in Denmark is the Czech Republic. Ah, right. <laughs> Czechia now, I believe. Mm -hmm. Um but yeah, no, I I lived in like a swamp, and it was very not interesting. The trees weren't cool, so there was no tree climbing. There was just we had great thunderstorms though, and I I missed those. But yeah, uh, exploration I would say mm -hmm. the exploration aspect of it. It's I can I can certainly get I'm I'm from the I'm from the Midwest, and mm. there's there's some there's some interesting things in the forest. <laughs> oh. Yeah. It's bec it's because of that that growing up I was more scared of werewolves than it was of some something like vampires. Huh. Well, I don't know. According to Twilight, they all live in like deciduous forests. Yeah, but yeah, but um, par 
I would say pardon my French, but this is my show, and fuck Twilight. Oh, uh, fair <laughs> enough. Uh, <laughs> all I'm saying is you never know. It just depends on who's writing your story. <laughs> You're like, ah, oh, I'm safe. I was, do- I was doing a Vampires book. in the Midwest. Meanwhile, a title of the book, like Vampires in the Midwest. Like, I was, no! <laughs> I was doing a book review thing at the time, and I had to read all four of those damn books. And I absolutely hated it because there's so much nothing. I read them willingly, and I was hooked, but I was also 10. Um, <laughs> I was it not. Was, it was the hot thing to do. It was like, read Twilight and be cool at school. Uh, oh. So I definitely did all of that. <laughs> yeah. I will say, it was hard to put down. I I read them. Uh, it also had a little bit of like Aragon Syndrome, though. I do agree. Where you're just like, anyways, <laughs> flipping through. Where's the next interesting part? Here we go. Action. Yeah. But, um... It now when it comes to tales from Myriad, you you um you've kind of state you kind of stated that it's heavily that it's heavily inspired by um, console style RPGs. What what um what some would call JRPGs, but I do not like that phrase. I have not liked that phrase for twenty years. <laughs> but were there any were there any specific um video games that ser- that served as inspiration? Yeah, so when I quote, like, JRPGs, it's specifically because there were Japanese artists uh, who worked on those games that I'm uh, very inspired by. Namely, uh, Yoshitaka Amano of Final Fantasy, like, fame, and uh, Akihiko Yoshida, who did um, Tactics Ogre, Final Fantasy Tactics. Mm-hmm. Um, now, Tactics Advance, which is also very close to my heart, very much so, but the game, I would say, is not artistically inspired by Tactics Advance. Yeah. Um, there are just aspects of Advance, and like the, the whole clothing and fashion aspect of all of that, of, of like all of that stuff combined, definitely so, 100%, because I just love... Um, mm-hmm. I love cool clothes. I love cool uh, costuming and outfitting. Yeah. And tactics, tactics advance, Amano, in spades, and I, I like always loved that stuff. So, yeah, though, um, Amano was mostly was mostly doing, mostly doing the mostly doing the cover art by the time Tactics Advance came along. Other other people were handling the art, especially since I'd say it's around the around the PS One era is when um, things started to shift heavily towards. Um, Nomura's style because hit because his style yeah. was going to be well. Let, let's be honest. Even with modern tech, it would be really hard to take Amano's art and put that in 3D. Even in 2D, you'd ha- you'd be having trouble. <laughs> um, yeah, you're, you're right about that. So uh, Amano did the concept art mm-hmm. for Final Fantasies one through six, uh, and then a few illustrations for like seven going on because then it was Nomura. Yeah, um, the although I will say, Dissidia did a great job at making it. Uh, Final Fantasy Dissidia mm-hmm. or Dissidia uh, yeah. did a good job at taking Amano's outfits and making them three D. And I still it's... love Amano. I I put yeah. Amano above Nomura as I, far as my taste. I like bo- I like both of them. Um, but it's more it's more a matter of of Amano's st- Amano's style would ju- would just be w- would just be way too complex to ha- to handle. Especially in especially in the PS One days, when everybody's just figuring out this whole polygon thing, and oh yeah, I mean like Nomura, I don't think Nomura's bad. I just think that they shouldn't have made a, a concept artist a game director. Oh, because <laughs> cause well, he, st- he started out, he started out as a monster designer in five. Oh, did he? Yeah. But I was not aware. I didn't play a lot of five. Yeah. But um. Now one of the, uh, one of the one of the big one of the big points that that was brought to my attention is doing two d six of all the of all the die setups. What made you go with two d six as the Rome that all roads lead to? Um. There was a couple of reasons. Some of them are design. Some of them are marketing. First of all, was that um. I needed to make something that was not what 
people were expecting from their tabletop RPGs, which was a D20 system. Mm-hmm. Um, I had been working on Myriad for about two years before it's like gotten to this point. So, you know, the whole OSR, not OSR, um, the, the OGL uh, shenanigans hadn't happened yet. So there was not a huge influx of everybody all at once going, we're all going to make our own games. Um, I had just started working on this. So partially that, partially like I need to differentiate it and there's no way I'm going to compete with a D20 system um, as far as marketing goes. Secondly, it was because I believed that um, a D6 was more accessible than a D20 to people who had not played games. It's like easier to get D6s. They, they're pretty common. They're pretty easy to understand. Uh, mechanically speaking, you can do different things with the D6 that I found to be uh, better for what Myriad has to offer, like the exploding aspect of it for crits, um, the way that it works for casting magic, I because uh, I didn't want there to be like a spell slot type of deal. I wanted it to be a, a gamble instead of a resource. Um, and because 2D6 has an average... Um, there's a bell curve to it, which makes statistics uh, work in your favor so that you don't have to continuously add uh, floating modifiers and stacking abilities and whatnot to people's kits, which are hard to keep track of um, on paper and went, like as opposed to keeping track of them online, which is how most people keep track of uh, the more complicated D20 games. I didn't want that. I wanted it to be pretty simple. You just have your character sheet. And it's it's playable in person with a character sheet. Like, you, you don't have a bunch of people with their laptops open. Um, mm-hmm. So, that was why. There, there, was, there were many reasons. Um, and I think it was a good decision. I like yep. it. Uh, the, uh, the other thing that I, f- that I found... I found amusing because it's a, because you, t- you dipped into a concept that I think more games should use, period is exploding dice. <laughs> mm. Yes. <laughs> um, the inclusion of that, that was pretty simple. Um, there needed to be a crit mechanic. Uh, and I didn't have a d20. So I was like, well, how do I want crits to work in this game? And I was like, oh, exploding dice. Like, that's that's perfect. That's great. I also found it to be um, volatile and dynamic, which... Mm-hmm. Uh, I thought was more fun to design a game around than uh, a more calculated like 5% chance that you do twice the amount of damage. Um, Yeah, I don't know. I just didn't like it. I was just like, eh. Like, you could have a a faster paced, more exciting game when the numbers start going all over the place uh, because of the exploding dice. And Funny thing, funny thing is, and this is this is where I have to bring up my relationship with with D and D Fourth Edition is they had a specific reason why they killed off the whole double damage uh, motif. Then the reasoning for that was um, a sp- was a spikiness, where it, a doing double damage on say a D four isn't going to be as impact isn't is supposed to be impactful, but it's not going to feel impactful compared to somebody doing double damage with, say, 2d6. Right. So, and of, co- of course, there was, the other, there was the other problem back in third of confirmation rules, which yes. nobody <laughs> I know liked. I'm pretty sure you didn't like them either, because... I'm pretty sure we did them wrong, is how it worked. Uh, the way that we played it is that if you wanted that double damage, you had to get two nat 20s in a row, <laughs> That's which how, is that not is... how it works. Um... It's not far off, though. You st- you have to hit them successfully again, right? You have to you ha- you have to you have to um, if you hit them successfully, it's just max. If you crit a second time, then it's doubled. Oh, okay. Which yeah. is the reason what? Which I think is the reason why everybody I've asked about it hated it because it's ca- because it's kind of it's kind of um. It's kind of pulling the rug from you, or or get or, I think one of my best friends had said it's it's like giving somebody, it's like giving somebody a a cake while also kicking them below the belt. Yeah, it's, it's just kind of like you got a crit. No, you didn't. I was like, oh okay. Yeah, 
And um, but it, it's funny you brought up the like different die sizes being more or less important is because um, kind of taken from like Dark Soulsy stuff. I like the idea that uh, daggers and the like can crit better, um, which is why the exploding dice applies to all dice rolls, including the damage rolls. So when you're dealing with a D4 weapon, mm -hmm. it is a 25% chance. And of course, you have a critical range that you can increase. So if you build for luck and you're effectively building for crit, um, it makes light weapon play very rewarding. Mm -hmm. Cause, which is a good thing, since in a lot of games, um, light weapons like da like daggers are ju are just tr are, end up being treated as you want you wanted a heavier weapon, but you don't have proficiency so you're, or you can't afford it, so you're stuck with these things. Right, as opposed to like, and I was talking about like increasing your critical range. There's stunts in the game which players can kind of use to take narrative control of combat as well that also increase your. Uh, critical range mm -hmm. um, amongst other things like uh, there are jobs like the thief that have better ways of, of increasing it um, but effectively just like do it being more actionable to get cooler and bigger crits you know because you get to the point where there's a 75 percent chance of exploding mm -hmm. and you have a high enough luck um, then your your piddly little letter opener starts to really hurt <laughs> and it feels and it feels more just like i said like uh, well, I guess just like the job fantasy aspect of it, um, mm -hmm. and as well as just the dynamicism of the game. Yeah. And now, when it comes to when it comes to creating characters, I do appreciate that you have full character creation. Um, in this, um, some previews or the like, um, tend to rely on pregens. Yeah. But with the with the varying um. With the varying kindred that are, that are, in... actually, no, I was going to ask about benefits when it came to kindred and homeland, but it looks like that was that's already <laughs> that's already answered within. Correct. The... There are none. <laughs> yeah. So shift. So shifting away. Shifting away from that. Um, when it comes to the concepts of banes and boons, a advantage and disadvantage setup. Um, in the demo, it mentions that you can only pick one. You can only. You can only pick one of each, at mo mm -hmm. at most. Was there an earlier version where you, where um where people could pick from multiple and it was this and it was decided that wasn't going that wasn't going to work? Um, no. The reason why banes and boons exist in the game is because of the fact that character creation is largely random. So it's there for people who are like a hundred percent. I'm gonna push my character in this direction. To which the game says, fine, but you have to take a Bane. Um, and you can only do that, like, once. Uh, because there, there just is a limit to game start min-maxing before you've even played the game. Mm -hmm. um, it's just set up to be not in your favor for doing that. You can get more Banes and Boons later. Uh, it's part of the exploration chart, I believe. You can find a thing where you get... Um, a boon and, and take a bane but no just for character creation it's just like you take one like it's optional you can you can push it around a bit like you can have your one little thing like if your stats are so trash um also the other reason is because you cannot decrease a score below two so you could technically just keep taking the same one until it's two and get an infinite number of uh like bonuses Mm -hmm. Um, so that's just not a thing. A yeah. limited one. Mm hmm But, but, um, when it comes to, now, with that in mind, when it comes to the, when it comes to the job system that you, ha that you have here, um, I did, I did note that when it comes to how, when it comes to how levels work in that, um, getting a getting a tier, getting a tier ability every every um every three le every three levels. Um, I am cu what I am curious about though are the are um the the re the reason that there that there's two that there's um two levels where where you're not where um 
where you're get your if I'm not mistaken, you're mainly getting um stat increases like it's say let's say from level one to two and level two to three. Uh you do not get stat increases. Nope. You get health increases. Alright. Yeah, so the I'm... aim of the game is to use personal quests to get stuff like stat increases and mm -hmm. to diversify your kit. Ah. Which is to to me because the game's main mode is like a milestone leveling, it puts the incentive on like if you want to get better, you need to go do things. Um, you can't just sit around and twiddle your thumbs until the game master kind of, you know, a level drops down from the heavens. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you're better now. And it's like, it's crazy that I got better at my magic casting when I haven't cast any magic like this yeah. whole time. It's like, yeah, no. Like, it, you, uh, your personal accomplishments will make you grow as a person, mm -hmm. um, which is true in the game and in real life. So. Yep. So. I'd like to go through the the um, jobs that are available and just just kind of get a fee just kind of get a feel for the for the play style as well as what um what classes or jobs from other games that might be analogous to. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm pretty sure a lot of these are a lot of these are pr are probably going to be pretty pretty set pretty set in pretty set in stone, but um I fig I figured this I figured it'd be a thing to humor about. Um, starting with Scholar. Yeah, the Scholar. Um, the important thing to note about the Scholar is that they are not the same as a wizard or sorcerer class. Because there is very little inherent magic that exists in Myriad, there's not like you're going out and memorizing spells. Spells and magic exist within magical items, and then they can be channeled out through like your own understanding of them. Mm -hmm. um, so the Scholar's abilities revolve... Uh, partially around the magic aspect of them, partially a toolkit uh, like the Conjurer uh, thing, but they're they're pretty good at uh, I mean studying things first of all. Pretty good at studying things. They can cast magic pretty consistently, pretty safely, um, and they can really diversify their kit to get uh, stuff like light and medium armor later. Mm -hmm. where it, they, they just become more hardy and more formidable, so they don't have to stay squishy forever. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much them. So that's yep. the, the scholar. Yep. Um, Hunter, would it be accurate of me to say that it's analogous to a, to an archer or a, or even a sniper from Tactics Advance? A uh, little bit, yes. It's It's blending between that and the ranger trope what with all the nature abilities and stuff mm -hmm. but it's not so heavily on like they don't walk around with pets they're not like hunters from uh world of warcraft they they are the survivalists they are good at tracking and foraging and they provide pretty good damage they're, they're one of those like hybrid classes uh where they're broken down between support and uh, limited combat ability. Uh, they are really good for the exploration phase of things. Uh, if because travel is a thing in Myriad, uh, they can really, really help you out with that. Where, you know, they they don't need to rest as long. Uh, they can forage for supplies. They can make the medical kits that help with healing. Um, and then later they can even take limited nature spells. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, they're one of those. They're they're one of the hybrid jobs. And so, what I do, what I do find interesting is in recent in recent years with with the world's most litigious fantasy game, as I've nicknamed it, um, rangers have been a have been a cursed <laughs> um, class in in their design, and I and from what I'm seeing in this, a lot of the pitfalls that happen with it, you end up avoiding, namely. Not ha namely, not having them be casters, which is something that I have always argued for since day one, and be and fo and um, not having something like favorite enemy, which I always felt favorite enemy worked ba favorite enemy and favored terrain were things that worked backwards to where to what they should have. <laughs> right. Mostly because if you're not in that and if you're it's asking the GM to have that enemy or that terrain present in the campaign in order to get use out of it otherwise it's a wa otherwise it's a waste 
that's kind of the problem with rangers in general where they they can only exist uh and be good within a specific setting um you know like even in even in fifth edition or or like dungeons and dragons specifically they're historically really great at the whole exploration and travel and tracking and survivalist thing but when you have a game that says that they're really good at that but you never provide the tools uh for that to be occurring then it winds up getting skipped it winds up getting ignored uh which is why like you know there's the exploration and travel chart in myriad where it says like okay this is a part here's the tools for it this is how you run it um so it gives them that place to be very good but yeah like a lot of people they kind of get tripped up with with rangers because they always want them to be something that they're not um or like the ranger archer archetype um, the the attitude that i've that i've taken with with um the concept of ranger is people stop bringing up aragorn and legolas as the template for your for your ranger you need to think you need I would to say <laughs> you need instead of going with that go with rambo in first blood <laughs> that dude i don't know if he counts as a ranger <laughs> I'd say um, he. I'd say he does. <laughs> I'd say Aragorn is makes a pretty good ranger with his uh, his ability to track and be stealthy, uh, his general weapon finesse, but also his ability to heal and like use natural elements. Yeah, I think that makes him a good ranger. But no, I. It's like people want rangers to be, um, either like they think they always think of rangers as like a, a video game type deal where it's like they're either. DPS arrow dispensers or uh, they want it to be the World of Warcraft Hunter uh, where they have a pet those, and those are mechanically things that <laughs> I feel like the same when you're doing a tabletop game yeah and I um, building a class just just around being a specialist in a weapon in my in my opinion isn't enough yeah exactly unless unless you're dealing the only time I've ever I, that I'm willing to tolerate that kind of thing is if it's a weapon that is extremely spe extremely specialized, like say a gun blade, <laughs> right? Or or the cr or the crazy ass weapons that you see coming out of Monster Hunter. Yeah, exactly. But um, which uh, are more like fighter things. But yeah, for the ranger, well, it's always it's, it's they've always had like a weird niche to fill. And if the game doesn't provide the tools to fill those niches, then uh, they just suck. <laughs> I've, I have, I have, I have also argued that the that fighter as a as a class is way too, is oddly enough the opposite problem, being way too broad. Because just yeah. being just being good with weapons does just being good with weapons and being able to equip any weapon doesn't have all that much impact when most people are going to pick a certain way they they equip their character and stick to it. Yeah, I mean that's why there is no fighter class in a uh, myriad. <laughs> no, and you have the you have the marauder, but the the marauder just just strikes me as the um, close range shit wrecker. Yeah, a little bit. Um, the marauder, between the marauder and the duelist, the marauder is meant to be more untrained. Um, they are more hardy. Uh, guts but they also they, they've also got right a little bit but they've also got those like support abilities kind of snuck in there like mm -hmm. uh tackle and you die when i tell you and what is it like inspiring critical or something like that yeah or, like you give people temp health when when you get a crit um so they they can turn into a very support heavy um fighter which kind of like warlord or um things of that matter mm-hmm but the but the but then then we have um a cultist yeah the cultist i like them so i mean they they're pretty they're they're pretty simple they're they are dark magic casters um and they become very resilient to to various dark effects like you know they can become immune to curses mm -hmm. um and, you know, cursed items, some spells are labeled as curses, some miscasts are labeled as curses. Uh, they've got their dark casting, so they can, like, ramp up the magic power, which uh, turns into miscasts, which makes, like, casting with components more uh, 
incentivized with them because mm-hmm. um, you know that the the image of an occultist using a component to you know to bargain make dark bargains and then like for for power and whatnot uh yeah pretty much they're just your your creepy crawly i they're pretty simple they they do not have as many defenses as a scholar does they they are much more keyed in towards damage the occult spell list as well Mm -hmm. um there's a lot more damaging effects uh, as opposed to the occultists and the arcane spell list, which has uh, far more utility effects. Yep. Uh, I also like that you snuck in a little bit of blue mage in there. Yeah, of course. Um, I love that. I've always loved the ability to just like copy, copy stuff. Mm-hmm. I've always because th- my favorite kind of magic was the magic I couldn't have. Um, so if there's ever a spell that somebody cast in a game that I could never get, I'd be like, oh, but I want that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so. That's in there for me. <laughs> Plus, I remember I remember playing Al Qadim and which w- which was a Arabian Nights style um, take take on AD and D and the class I would always play as the spell thief, which does exactly mm-hmm. what it sounds like it does. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, and um, when it comes to du- when it comes to the duelist, I'm guess I'm guessing this is for the this is for those who want who. Either either want to be the fencer or or the swordmaster, the kind the kind of person who, um, will will um will out will outfight you and look good while doing it. Yeah, pretty much the the duelist kit. The duelist is a combo character. Um, I, I've kind of broken people down into like support, meta, combat, and combo. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they they exist as a combo character where you set up these really tasty combos of events to happen, uh, and then just everything goes your way. Uh, they are designed to slap at at one on one combat. Like you just won't beat a duelist. Mm. Um, the duelist is the more trained person, so you could like a soldier, like a more trained soldier, um, would fall into the duelist category. The anime swordsman would fall into the the duelist category. Like you know, they've got that cross slash ability in there. And every um, swashbuckler over the last hundred years. Yeah, exactly. Like swashbucklers would be duelists. Oh. Um, so yes, classic, classic and, duelist. And and um anybody anybody who abu- who abused playing Raphael when I was still when I was playing when I'd be playing Soul Calibur with my usual group. <laughs> right. <laughs> I hate that guy. <laughs> um, and when it comes to the merchant, I I'm guessing there's a I'm guessing there's a little there's a little bit of chemist in them. Yes. A little bit of chemist, a little bit of antiquary and from Darkest Dungeon as well. Mm-hmm. But yeah, absolutely. Absolutely the chemist. I mean just with throw. Yeah. Just chucking items at people because it's so great. The merchant is is one of the meta jobs um, where they suck at combat, but they're really good at not getting hit, um, and they they improve everybody's life outside of of the game. You know, just like here's all these items I have, here's all these potion recipes I have, here's all the stuff I, I can carry all these things, uh, and then I can throw them to you. <laughs> um, I mean, they're they're my favorite job uh, oh. at the moment. I'm pretty. I'm pretty sure somebody who knows what they're doing could bu- could build a merchant into being the equivalent of a um, demo man from Team Fortress. Oh, I mean, absolutely. Yep. I mean, and they're total crit masters as well. Yep. Like they, they. I mean, they become untouchable and the the whole like crown toss and stuff like that mm-hmm. uh, to just like do insane amounts of damage at the very very end of the line. Uh, I like them. Yeah. Um, thief. Um. I think the it's always it's always interesting to to do um th- to do the thief archetype because th- because um one of the big things of thieves is stealing stuff but how are you going to do that when you're dealing with monsters? <laughs> mhm. The you may be looking at an outdated version of the uh demo because because I, I regularly make little updates to it. So they originally had, which you may be looking at, uh, the quick swipe ability. But I realized that that um, that's was not, difficult. That's not in there. 
That's not in the oh, version. Oh, it's not. I have. Okay, so so you are seeing the updated. Yeah, version. Um, good, I good, was good. more I was more speaking in I was more speaking in general, but I'm guessing the I'm guessing the vibe that you have with Thief is the dirty fighter. Yeah, a little bit. Um, being stealthy because you have to put in you have to put room in there for all of the things that a thief is, and people. I mean, they they all have an idea of what. <laughs> A thief is basically. And, um, some people want to be pickpockets. Some people want to be assassins. Some people um, want to be the the gutter fighter. If you um, and if you listen, if you listen close in the distance, you can hear somebody shouting, "I'm not a thief. I'm a treasure hunter." Right. Exactly. <laughs> um, the the thief. Let me look at their thing. Yeah. So I I realized that originally their ability was quick swipe that was their starting ability where they could steal an item off of a uh, loot table mm -hmm. and then it wasn't fun was the problem because it required now while there is like a sample list of like oh if you roll a one it'll be like trash worth three crowns to 15 crowns or like whatever in like slot one mm -hmm. um but it kind of it turned it a little bit video gamey, and also I noticed that people weren't playing the thief like they didn't they didn't like that idea, um, so I had to make it more fun for me. And they now have tool belt, so they get item recipes, which makes them like the concept of procuring components more uh, interesting because it takes a component to make an item, but also their tool belt of you know being able to handle certain situations, uh, amongst which are you know cow chops smoke bombs rope of returning like mm -hmm. stuff that thieves would have anyways um pretty much yeah now of course next is performer which oh i'm guessing this is where this is where you'd put your your bard and your and your dancer alike a little bit um they are strategists they they are, I think the, the thing with Bard is that you kind of expect to be like, oh, I'm like kind of good at everything and I can, I can fill in. Uh, that is not what the performer does. The performer has a very specific job of controlling and manipulating the battlefield. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, and they have, of course, their skills, uh, which make them good in social situations, their persuasion, deception, diplomacy, and performing. Um, cause you also got to look at their skill tool set. Like you, you look at the Marauder and it's like, oh, it's a lot of combat stuff, but then they have that skill in their feet of strength, uh, which then turns them into powerhouses outside of combat as well. So similarly with a performer, um, broken down into, uh, vocal instrumental theater and dance, uh, performances. Mm -hmm. And I mean, just the abilities in there and just the ability to control the battlefield. Yep. Um, is what I think makes them fun because I designed a lot of these jobs so that I would find them fun. And my problem with playing a bard is that I could never do the stuff I wanted. Um, I always felt useless in combat, and so I'm like, I want the performer to not necessarily be dealing damage, but to still have like a big sway in the flow of combat. Mm -hmm. Which is which is complete, which is completely understandable. Um, now when it come when. When it comes to the hedge witch, would mm -hmm. the thing that immediately comes to mind to me is certain is certain types of druid or druid if you played if you had mystery of the druid stuck in your head for years. Hmm. Um. Yes and no. They are the nature casters, but I don't like druids um, because they are too strong. <laughs> yes, they are. They're yes, always they too are. strong. Um, they're always too strong. Their tool, their toolkit is far too diverse. Um, they can always do everything but better because turns out animals are good at a lot of different things, which is why <laughs> the ability to turn into an animal is a very limited one uh, for the hedge witch and how the nature spells work. Mm -hmm. um, I much prefer the uh, the cultivator um but also the aspect the witch aspect of them which is uh more of a rural kind of support you know like 
the medicine woman, the the village elder, the, the witch doctor, right? Like a a little bit stuff like that, um, where you're you're dealing with somebody who uses uh, natural medicines and and tries to help you in practical ways before they resort to magical ways. Um, it was heavily inspired by the Discworld witches, who uh, in Terry Pratchett's Discworld they are very much magical. But magic is the last resort because, you know, the lazy, blasé use of magic when you really just need, you know, a simple herb or to be told to deal with it um, is just such a waste. Uh, and so there's a lot of things like that. You've also got the uh, the hag, the mother and the maiden, mm -hmm. which are like established witch tropes in there as well. Yeah. And their their natural bond, like connection to the natural earth. uh Kind of trope playing in there mm -hmm. as well so it's a little bit of a blend they they aren't exactly druids um because i didn't want to have druids yep um now with the sit with the sage um i'm guess i'm guessing the i'm guessing the sage is somewhat is somewhat analogous to to a a cleric, but not in the ar not in the armor and blunt weapons side of a cleric. I guess more of a white mage. Yeah, a little bit. Um, they're pretty formidable. They, uh, you can see, they're um, they've got some of the social options like soft spoken, like they can calm animals down. Mm -hmm. um, they're a little bit of a balance between, like the oracle and mediator, a little bit from tactics. Like I. I didn't want just like a flat cleric um, or a priest either because it it just isn't the same in Myriad. Like you don't get the whole like, ah, oh, I'm blessed and chosen by the gods. Like I'm going to go do their bidding. It's like, no, not really. Um, that's not how like the sages work. It's more about the wisdom yeah, it uh, is, of it. It is interesting that you bring up the or the Oracle from Tactics because the design of the orc of that Oracle was... Heavily rooted in the um, on Miyunji. Oh, I think I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah, which is ev evident by them having what was referred to as Yin Yang magic. Yes, yeah, that's right, exactly. So there's a little bit of that in there, a little bit of like taking the Oracle name as well as so you can see it down there in like mm -hmm. uh, Star Seeker. Um, where they get portents, so they can do a little bit of fate weaving and whatnot. Um, yeah, pretty much them. Mm -hmm. they're, they're pretty bread and butter. They're really, really effective. Uh, their chant ability is just like so crucial if you're dealing with like poison or or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And um, the mystic, I took one look at the mystic, and I immediately said, "Yep, these are the monks." Well, it's funny you say that because they are getting a complete rework. <laughs> um, the problem with the mystic is that I didn't want them to be monks um, because real monks don't punch people. So, and then there's also talking about like, I just had a really, really long discussion with my friend whose thesis was in this. Um, issues with Orientalism in tabletop games. And like, I, I aimed to move away from that i was like i don't want them to like be asian or like harken back to like asian orientalism um would it be easier if i said pugilist? That good... well that's the other thing they're not a pugilist either like i didn't want them to be a fist fighting boxer mm -hmm. um the the problem is like the concept of a mystic martial artist is in and of itself orientalist so the way that the mystic is going to be getting reworked is that they are going to go back into like a mystic's route. They are going to be a toolkit. They are going to be able to dabble in a lot of little things. Diegetically speaking, they have a more neutral stance on the, the case of uh, order versus chaos. But not in the way that scholars do, more in a, in like a seeing beyond it, um, like operating within both. So they will have the ability to pick up potions and poisons they will be able to influence other people there will be some of the like psychic ability still in there um they'll be able to pick up random divine and occult spells but be able to use like whatever stat they want um between insight and occult um and yeah so they are 
they are not going to remain this way. They are, in fact, going to be changed. Uh, because I also had to think about, you know, it's a job, not a class, right? They've got these dungeons that exist for sure in the world. There's a reason for them being there. So what does the mystic have to do with any of that? Like, why would you bring a mystic into a dungeon? And right now, all they do uh, is punch good. And I, I didn't really like it from a design sense either. Um, so yeah, they're going to be getting changed. Mm -hmm. uh, now, when it comes to magic, um, I think one one of the big thing one of the big things that is being done here that you don't see all that often is the is the you is relying on ma relying on essentially magic items in order to do. Um, casting. I think the on the only thing that comes close the only thing that comes close to my not to my knowledge, as far as far as as if I'm not doing deep cuts, is the ciphers when it comes to well cipher system, um, especially especially with Numenera how all of the ciphers are these forms of strange technology that aren't fully understood. You know, Clark's law to its furthest extreme. I'm unfamiliar with it, so I, I was not brushed up on it. The reason that I did it was because um, I didn't want to lock people out of not being able to cast magic. I wanted it to be like, you, you find a magical item and you get excited for it because you don't know what spells are inside of it. And then you see it, or you get it, but it has stuff you can't, uh, has stuff in it that you can't cast yet. Mm -hmm. So it, it becomes a personal goal to uh pursue that magic um the other reason was because um uh, i wanted people to feel an attachment to the stuff that they have so when you get this magical item you know not only is it yours in the sense that it looks different like it has these unique adjectives and descriptions for them um but the spells inside of it are unique so the the next thing you find the next spell item you find, you have no idea what's going to be inside of it, and it's exciting uh, to get. And yeah, like I said, it's it was mostly about the not locking people out of the magical items uh, situation of it, and also I just like magic items. It sound it sounds like the approach you're taking is any anybody can theoretically use magic, but some are going to be better at it than others. Yeah, well, the way that it works is that when you are casting a spell, you roll a number of d6 up to your magic modifier um so you have to have a magic modifier of plus one or higher um and then you're trying to hit a casting difficulty by rolling uh equal to or higher than the the number uh based on the face of the dice so it is not the sum so you roll like you have a casting difficulty of four like four up and you roll a five a three and a six it's two successes mm -hmm. um so yeah, so then it becomes like, oh, I've just barely gotten it to one dice. Like, I can maybe cast this spell as long as it doesn't require multiple successes. You know, like, I gotta charge and really think about it, and it's hard. Um, but if I have a component, maybe I can get this thing, like, I can start turning into uh, that. Yeah. And... Is it a... Is it a, when it comes to casting difficulty? Is it a case where you need to have at least one die that's at that minimum, or is it a case where you're dealing with a total? Uh, one die at the minimum. It's not a sum. Like you don't add them together. All right, I I can get I can get behind that, and that prevent that presents an interesting trade off because if somebody just has a um say an say an arcane of one. They 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 are gonna they're going to be ha they're going to have to, um, either 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 be patient or be lucky when it comes to rolling when it comes to casting it. But if I'm reading this right, they what it would be all but impossible for them to suffer a miscast. Uh, a little bit, only a little bit, because your dice can still explode when you're casting. So if you roll a six, you do roll another one. And if you roll a six on that, well, now you, now you've miscast. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, exactly. Um, so yes, there there is a little bit. So it's like it's possible. You can do it. I I did manage to roll. Um, I only had a plus two, and I did manage to get a times three success in something. 
because uh, I charged it and it wound up exploding. Mm -hmm. So it can be done. But it also um, sounds that e even if you even if you end up not doing well with the roll, you can still you can still keep trying again. It's just you're going to be paying for you're going to be paying for for it in time instead of in some kind of resource. Yep. Yeah. Uh, there's no spell slots in the game because mm -hmm. I thought that it was silly that there is a limit to how much you can play your character. Uh, before the game says no, you can't do that anymore. I've um, the Vancian model when it comes to spell slots has always been my whipping boy, and I, I put up a I put up a thing on 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 Twitter and on my Discord asking if there if there are any non D twenty based games that use that that use that same system. Um, I was only able to I was only able to come up with at most two. You would you would think that dying or that the Dying Earth RPG that Pelgrane did would use it, but nope, that it doesn't. Those two mm -hmm. were um, Legend of the Five Rings, which has a, which has a number of slots for each element when Shugenja used magic, but it's kind of disqualified because you still have to roll for it. It's not fire and forget. Mm -hmm. And the Vancian Order in Invisible Sun, which is meant to be a nod to that style of magic anyways. And even then, you're still rolling for it. Yeah, I, I I've always been like, yeah, either either roll or, or just like it happens. Because again, I mean the whole like, oh you cast it, oh you gotta roll for it, oh you missed. It's like cool. Not only did I use my turn, but I used like a resource for a thing that I'm not gonna get back, um, just to have missed, and it feels bad. I'm, so I'm like, it, it's already enough that mm -hmm. that like you have a limit on how much you can play the way that you want to play. I'm um, fine with it if the if the setting justifies it. Like I also think that the spells are a problem. Like if all your spells are just combat spells and it's all spell slots, then it's like, well, it's not like I had fun options anyways to do cool things. All I could do is more damage, you know. Yeah. But although I do have to I do have to ask the question um how do you make a D70? How do you make a 70-sided dice? <laughs> uh, it doesn't technically exist. Uh, you would have to use a random uh, random generator, although you could find a way to, to roll D70. Uh, I think you would have to... Or, I mean, you first of all, you could roll a D100, and then just if it's higher than 70, then re-roll it. Uh, um, yeah, I just... I had... I had I had to get but my no, jokes in. No, it doesn't in. exist. <laughs> it's it's totally just like these. Uh, I mean, it's just there to be like, look, there's seventy options. Like, you need a random one. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, that I mean, maybe there will be a hundred of each by the end. Uh, not yeah. nature, but regardless, yeah, some zachi dice. <laughs> but uh, now, one thing one thing that I that I do. Again, I do find interesting that you do have these four, these four different t these four different types, and I'm guessing part of the ra part of the randomization is as of the spell list is as much for the GM as it is for players. Yeah, definitely. To that to that end, I'm curious if you've run um, Tales from Myriad as a um, hex crawl at any point. Um, not. Exactly. The travel can kind of be hex crawled. Um, it, it's designed like a little bit of hex based travel. Mm -hmm. um, but other than that, no, I haven't. Yeah. And one th one thing that I I did notice is when it comes to mi when it comes to miscasts. Um. Unless you unless you end up getting really uh, really unlucky, a lot a lot of the a lot of the miscasts are more are more in the line of weird things than say the than say the um, miscasts that you might see in Warhammer Fantasy. Yeah, that was super. That was a hundred percent on purpose. I because I uh, first of all like you don't want people to be scared of playing the game, <laughs> like scared of rolling like or, or scared of failure I, i've never liked the whole like oh you miscast and blew everybody up because then it's like thanks dude you know like that's not fun it's just it's just not fun to miscast and get hurt 
Um, it's way more fun to have your fingers turn into snakes uh, where you can't grab anything. Um, because now not only is your life miserable and you wish you would have just taken some damage, um, but it's funny and everybody can laugh at you. <laughs> Pretty much. Um, it, there's just more entertaining ways to do it than it's just like, you damage, or you take damage. Because, I mean, there's there's also different ways to inconvenience people than just damage. Like, you look at the, oh, my hair turns into fire for, like, the next, like, whatever. Like, I'll be fine. Not if you're trying to sneak around. Like, fireworks shoot out of your mouth every time you talk. Like, you're you're not going to be able to, to sneak or do stealth or, like, do a few crucial actions. Um, and some of them are more punishing than others. But, uh, yeah, no, they're, they're designed to be incredibly inconveniencing while not attacking your hit points uh, so that they're fun. Yeah. And they become challenges to play around. I will admit one th one thing that you put in in the demo, which I'm guessing is going to be expanded a bit further in the full in the full book, is a monster maker. Because I have been campaigning for years that uh, monster creation systems need to be something that's normalized in role playing games. Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, I it, it's why there's not like a bestiary in the demo. There will be monsters included in the book, just to be like, hey, this is how I, I make some of them. But, like, the, the concept of selling monsters always felt so cheap to me. It's, like, it's, like, they're for the DM. Like, why are you selling the DM or the GM, like, content that they need to run the game outside of what you've already given them? Like, teach them how to make monsters. Like, they, they want to do that. They need to do that to challenge their players in interesting ways. And so... Yes, the monster manual or the, the monster creation guide will, will go into further detail. It's a bit bare bones, but there's also a lot of like philosophy behind the uh, like creation philosophy behind the monster maker that has been included. Like here are things like mechanics you can include that are fun for you, the game master to run. Um, and here is how you balance them and, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. The, the reason why I've advocated for it is uh, no matter how many monsters you make, there's go there's going to be an inevitable um, issue of issue of something of an encounter that a GM wants to make that the monster list isn't going to satisfy. Exactly. Es yeah. Especially when it comes to the matter of um, b bags. You're you're big mm -hmm. bad evil guys. Yeah, totally. Because a lot of a lot of the let's. Let's consider let's consider some of the some of the b bags that have been in. Well, ju I'll just use Final Fantasy for it, for instance. And since we brought up tactics, let's let's talk about Ultima. Mm -hmm. Um. And get any if the only way I could work Ultima into into the more litigious games is by a whole lot of reskinning and a whole lot of hacking. Yeah. Oh. Um, or the, just making it yourself, which is what we're talking about, anyways. Well, if, if I'm going to be making it myself, at the very least, give at the very least give me a bit of guidance, so it's not you pushing me into the deep end of the pool and saying swim, damn it. Right. Exactly. Like, is it possible that I can just that I can just make it on my own? Yes, but it but um. Well, you shouldn't have to. Is the thing right? You, you just shouldn't have to. <laughs> make everything on your own you as the game master have to make everything else anyways and now it's like oh also design monsters that's like dude you sold me a game <laughs> like i should just know how to do that should just be a part of being a game master is knowing how to make monsters and that shouldn't just be the deep end of the pool like you're saying if you're if you're run if you're running um if you're if you're the regardless of the kind of games um if you need to, if you need to add cannon fodder, it's a good. It it'll be, it'll be good to have a means to do that quickly. Mm -hmm. um, something that I think I think laws said said at one point, just add ninjas. <laughs> <laughs> right, people that die within one hit point, they all they do is they clog up. They just clog up the field. They have a bunch of hits. Mm -hmm. Now, admittedly, when he was saying that, that was that was in reference to the um, f to his feng shui game, which is meant which is meant to emulate action movies. Ah. Uh, so his so his mindset are things are things slowing down? Add ninjas. Yeah, suddenly <laughs> it's like oh gosh. But um, 
one of the one of the other things I did find interesting is the um special is the specialty class. I'm guessing this is your equivalent mm -hmm. to prestige classes, and each of them are they still operating on a on a on a tier system on the tier system, or is it a case? Yeah. Uh, so so. Sorry, yes, they are operating on the tier system. Basically, whenever you pick them up, whatever level it is that you pick them up becomes the new level one. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have the tier one and the tier two abilities. Um, the reason why they don't say tiers at the moment is because probably more like further explanation needs to be given that like whenever you take it, that's the new tier one. So you're not like, oh, but I get access to tier three because I'm level seven. So when I take this, I'll just have access to all of it. It's like, no, they, they're limited like that. I also totally forgot that prestige classes were a thing in 3.5. Um, that's So that's it's that's been fair. funny to look back at it. And I was like, oh, yeah, there were those, weren't they? No, it was it was more of the branching out aspect of yeah, like, job-based system. To be fair, um, the first prestige class wasn't even in the um, player's handbook. It was in the DM's guide. And right. the reason the reason for that is they ran out of room in the in the player's handbook, to which I said, you know, may, maybe if you hadn't made five or five or six hundred variants of detect, you might have some room. <laughs> right, exactly. Like how I mean, I did I did put the the specialty classes at the very end of the book mm -hmm. right now. Um, they they will be in the game master section, uh, but the reason that they're there is because. I don't want to incentivize players into being a special. Like, I don't want them to think that they need to be a specialty class to be good. Um, which is also why they lock you out of your previous stuff as well. Um, but yeah, it's kind of like, oh, hey, for like more diverse options, like you've got the, the specialty classes. Mm -hmm. um, so you can kind of discover that as a little treat yeah. when you're going through. You're like, oh, so sweet. Yeah, and there there are there are a few that are that are certainly are in are in, are interesting to me the <laughs> the it's a lot of a lot of them are pretty straightforward and then you get the aeromancer who <laughs> um strike strikes me as strikes me akin to the seeker from fourth edition or um green arrow <laughs> a little bit uh they are they're just super combo mm -hmm. that's that's a blend of a couple of things but like towerfall ascension uh, it was one of the, like the different arrow types. Um, was is always so much fun to play with. Uh, just somebody who has like arrows and arrow based magic is always cool. But yeah, a lot of the specialty classes y you may notice are more combat focused. Um, like a lot of the role play enhancing abilities uh, will be found in the core jobs. Mm -hmm. But the specialty classes are like, all right, you want to be good at one thing. Like okay, here, like you, you, you fire off magic arrows, and they do a bunch of different things, and they're super cool. Yeah. Now, since since guns are an option in it, I'm curious what would be the advantage or disadvantage of using a firearm versus using a bow. Guns ignore damage reduction, but take your reaction to reload. That's that's certainly one trade off. Whereas, what what advantage would um would going with a bow and arrow have they don't take your reaction to reload <laughs> um, fair enough pretty much uh so it's like guns guns are powerful um for the jobs that don't have combos mm -hmm. basically but you get into like uh like the hunter for example the hunter would not benefit from a gun uh, as much because they wouldn't be able to use the reaction to uh, fire off an extra arrow or whatnot. Or basically anybody that has anything that's a reaction um, mm -hmm. would not benefit from having a gun. Yeah, when, and when it comes to... I, I, did get, I did appreciate that the Great Bow can use power instead of finesse because a lot of people tend to forget how how much strength you need in order to in order to draw a bow yep <laughs> great bows yeah bows are powers power weapons and, and swords are finesse based that's the reality of it but we also we swapped it around oh and 
I do I do appreciate that when it comes to um reach weapons, it's not it's not all they're not all put in one cat in one um category. Because mm -hmm. I'm I'm guessing the if I'm and you can correct me if I'm wrong in this, I'm guessing that the line between light, medium, and heavy is if it can if it's one handed, if it's hand and a half, or if it's two handed. A little bit. Um the heavy weapons are two handed. Um it's it, it wasn't that specific. Um it was very much just like it does a D four, it does a D eight, it does a D twelve. Yeah. Um if it does a D four it's a light weapon. Uh and, and vice versa. Um so I it that it just makes weapons easier and also less punishing to have what you want. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, we've all been there. We're like, oh, it'd be really cool if I had this weapon. And it's like, oh, but it's like not as good as this other one because it's a die size down and it doesn't have reach. And if you want to really max your damage, you'll do blah, blah. And it's like, we'll be fine. You know, so it, it's just like, yeah, no, it's. Although, it's given given that, where would you put, say, a Sansetsukom, a, uh, th a three section staff? Oh, let me look it up and I'll tell you. How do you spell it? Oh, let me let me write. I found it. Oh, yeah. all right. Never mind. This, um, medium, medium polearm whip with reach. Mm -hmm. That's where I put it. Yeah, and I'm guess I'm guessing that. I'm guessing you'd probably put, say, tw say twin hooks as a medium weapon, just one, just one that tends to be paired. Uh, yeah, it may be dual. I mean, I think that's a little bit flexible. Like you can always, as a game, be like, oh, this one's a light weapon, but yeah, twin hooks probably be um, paired medium weapons. Oh. Uh, and I will. I do know that there is, there is what there is. There is one. There is one particular weapon that would that would. Um, I'd probably count as medium that I know is gonna. Sh I know would show up because it shows up a lot in my games, and that's a. And I'm probably gonna mispronounce it again. Mahahuitil. Oh yeah, the. I don't know how to pronounce that. Um, that might be a heavy weapon. Just uh... just because just because of all the stone and all the obsidian involved. Yeah, well, it just it looks heavy. <laughs> is is my answer? It it looks heavy and big. Um, although, I mean, no, actually, these are pretty small, aren't they? Yeah. I think you could have a heavy one, but this one, this one looks. I don't know. That one looks like it's a, a light weapon, like in this picture. I think that that's dynamic. I think you could have it at any size. Um, another one that's a bit that's a bit underrated that I think would be interesting is the um, Polynesian Tayaha. Uh, this looks like a spear. It is it, it is both a spear and a club, because the back end the back end of the spear is flattened. Oh, neat. Well, yeah, yeah I would say um, I would say it's a pole arm hammer, mm -hmm. uh, with reach. Yeah, and I, I dig I dig into these kind of things because I've joked in the past that get that sword and board is the most boring way to equip a character. Yeah, to... oh, hundred percent. That that was also the that was also the reason why um one of my one of my fo one of my fond um campaign memories is ha is um was when I when I did a Roman themed game and instead of having everybody be gladiators every player was was managing a stable of gladiators <laughs> and I see it's kind of hard to do the. you can you could do the sword and board as gl in gla as gladiators. But you wouldn't have any armor. Mm -hmm. You know, the, you know, give having people really, really spend time thinking about their choice of weapons because, since you brought up Dark Souls, um, there's so many weapons in that um, have certain quirks that you have to keep in mind, like, like say, whips. Most people would think, why would you use a whip? That's useless. And then you realize whips go around shields. Right. Yeah, I mean, Myriad, maybe in a second book, mm -hmm. there would be the, like, martial abilities where it's like, oh, um, when you are fully proficient, you can 
uh, take like an extra ability based on the weapon that you have. Maybe you could um, call it some kind of art that you use with your weapon. Yeah, mm, you know, weapon art, nah. right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's. I mean, I wanted to outfit people with cool stuff, but I didn't want to punish them for it. Mm-hmm. Um, which is why it things have just been simplified into the weapon sizes instead of being like, oh, a dagger is a D four, but like, uh, this like half handed straight sword is a uh, D eight, and it's just like, oh, but I I just want to look like this. Yeah, that was that was my thing. Like, I just want to look like like aesthetically, I want two hammers. <laughs> you know, don't punish me for that. I just want to have two hammers at an aesthetic level. You just, um, you just but want also to provide lots of different like a, a big variety of weapons uh, as well so you just wanted to spend you just wanted to build up a character that's an xp of the hammer bros from mario 3 no i wanted to be <laughs> ranger veteran barden from vermintide 2 <laughs> <laughs> that, is what that, i wanted that'll that'll work um yeah like i i um also i, I will admit one one other type of weapon that sh- that shows up a lot in, so, in some of my stuff is the kopesh the kopesh that's the um which one is the co oh it's similar to the uh yeah it's the the curved curved weapon uh what's the one that's similar to it because i'm pretty sure that's in the game um what's the blade that's similar to a kopesh i would i would say i would say it would be sim- i would i would say it would be similar to a a a, a, a um a scimitar um, because uh, because no. of their curve, I'm thinking of something else. There's one that's like exactly like a kopesh, um, but I can't find it. Where's my weapons list? <laughs> bring bring the hither. I need to see this now. Oh. Surely I I included it. Yeah. Um, Shotel. Shotel, that's it. That's the one I'm thinking of. Yeah, a Shotel. The showtel is in the myriad, definitely. Yeah, I see. I see. It's it's. I've I've always like I've always liked the set the setup of it, and again, I tr- I try and dig into uh, dig into um, of 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 just a ver- just a variety of weapon types. Mm-hmm. Uh, cause I was all I was always that I was always that person who, when everybody would do sword and board, I would do um I would do poke and board. You know, spe- a spear and a shield. Ah, uh, yes, the Roman style. <laughs> and the and the Greek style. Correct. Uh But with with that in mind, um, what are you shooting for as far as the total page count when it comes to the completed book? It'll most likely be around the the two hundred mark. Although there's a good chance it'll be higher. Oh. Um, there's, I mean, the, the game basically has no flavor and fluff. It's like just mechanics and rules. And also there will be much more art. It mm-hmm. will be a fully stocked book, but it will be pleasant to go through. Um, it will not be like wasting space. Um, and there will be lots of good art and tool sets, like page spreads of like, so you're preparing a mystery mm-hmm. game master. Here are the things you need. And you're like, oh, cool. Yeah. So there's going to be lots of that stuff. Mm-hmm. Again, it'll. I want it to be a book that people actually read, <laughs> instead of yeah. just keep on the shelf. Um, one of the stretch goals did mention location lore as part as part of it. So I'm guessing th- I'm guessing there's there's going to be there there'd be lore about certain areas, but you're not planning on putting in a full map. Um, there will be a basic map, but it will. I mean, the map is meant to start off empty so that you travel and explore it. Mm-hmm. Um, but the locations of the countries and stuff like that will be. Uh, will be made. Yeah, because you do mention you do mention certain countries in in um ju- in just the step by step part of character creation, as well as some illusions in each of the jobs. Yes, uh, the the like where those jobs came from originally. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean the the homeland. The the idea behind the homelands was that the game would support various settings that you could play in. Um, for different types of games, basically. Um, it's like, oh, I want this kind of a campaign. It's like, oh, well, for Koji, it would be great for that, mm-hmm. uh, and so on. Yeah. And with that, with that in mind, what are you shooting for as far as a release window? Release window? Well, the book 
will probably be finished if things go well September mm -hmm. um, because there's lots of art there is lots of writing and then there's lots of layout <laughs> which is getting a person to turn all of those things into a book through uh, the alchemy of money into sorcery mm -hmm. um, so September is probably when it'll be done and then it will be printed and shipped to people um, but then the game will be perpetually available at metalweavegames.com um, because that is the publisher. You'll just be able to find that game there. You can do late backing. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and hopefully I'd like for the game to get in stores, but we'll see. Yep. And I will I will certainly be looking forward to, see, to seeing how it develops and also how people um, find find ways to hack it. Cause... Ugh, yeah, I'm I'm sure people will, but hopefully, because I I don't know where I stand on like the licensing thing, because I don't think I want people. That's not what I meant by hack. I meant. Oh, I'm... you just mean like. <laughs> when I say just hack in terms of whole rule sets. In, in terms of in terms of um oh in terms of tabletop is um oh is the is the crazy kind of homebrews. Yeah, it's. I don't know where I stand on that because I tried to make a really like concise system, um, because like I could that that was the thing when I was making it. I'm like, look, I could go into detail about like weapon systems and and whatnot, but it's better for the game to stay light. I will probably release like if I see that there's a thing that people are doing constantly, uh, it'll either a make it into the second book or make it into like a side thing uh as like hey here's an optional rule set like i've taked <laughs> i've taken the thing that you wanted to do and then i actually designed and balanced it up next to the rest of the game mm -hmm. um but you're never going to stop people from homebrewing uh, yeah i hope that the game what i want is what i wanted what the intent of the game was was to provide a tool set for like game masters who wanted to run games of you know this type um, that are easy and easy to get people into. Mm -hmm. So those those page spread like so you're planning a blank, you know, like the dungeon generator and the exploration and travel charts. Like those are some of the crowning achievements of it that you could pop this book open for pretty much anything, um, and wind up finding something useful. Mm -hmm. Well, like I said, I will be looking forward to seeing how it develops. So and. and... With that in mind, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. And Yeah, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> and of course, well, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>